Okay, welcome everybody to the face-to-face -face National Jury Exhibition Artist Talk. This is the first of two talks that we're going to um, host for the exhibition. I'm Stephen C. Wagner. I'm one of the partners of ARC, along with Michael Yoakum and Priscilla Otani. We're in our 13th year at um, ARC Gallery and Studios in San Francisco. We have an 8,000 square foot building south of Market on Folsom Street in San Francisco. So our first artist that we're gonna hear from is Paul Benavides. So Paul, if you could unmute yourself, introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. Tell us a little bit about your process and talk about your piece that's included in the exhibition. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. And uh, I'm a multidisciplinary artist and a vegan. Uh, I live in Sacramento. And I, I just want to congratulate uh, ARC uh, organization for its professionalism. And I'm, I'm really impressed. Uh, the process for creating Palestine uh, is pastel over pen and ink over 300 pound paper. And I use a typical, it's a life cell portrait. So I uh, use the typical mirror and I used uh, uh, reference point and uh, other techniques, uh, drawing techniques. And uh, I guess I should tell you a little about the inspiration of the piece. Uh, it, uh, it's about the ongoing conflict in the occupied territories. And uh, at the time there were two stories that were for me uh, just unforgettable. Uh, one was about an elderly Palestinian farmer uh, who had lost his uh, orchard uh, because the uh, Israeli defense forces bulldozed his olive orchard out of collective punishment. And uh, this is a, a orchard that was uh, handed down through generations over well over a century. And uh, here the, this family is left with without uh, their orchard, without uh, a means to make a living and whatnot. So you can imagine what that was like. And uh, the other one was uh, kind of hit a little bit home. It was uh, about uh, Rachel Quarry, who was an activist that uh, went to uh, the Gaza Strip uh, to uh, for her thesis, her undergrad thesis, and uh, she's American, and uh, she was uh, caught in the midst of this uh, conflict. Uh, she stood before uh, this armored bulldozer made by Caterpillar in the United States, uh, uh, operated by a, a soldier, an IDF soldier, and uh, uh, she was with other protesters. She was there to prevent the bulldozer from bulldozing a uh, Palestinian home. And the uh, operator, IDF operator, purposely ran over her uh, deliberately and murdered her. And, uh, and of course, he, he wasn't prosecuted. There was no prosecution involved. Anyway, these, these really hit home. And uh, it just sticks with you. And this is not the only kind of uh, atrocities that happen and they're all around the world. But uh, anyway, the, uh, the whole thing, it's, it's just the irony of the whole thing, the olive branch, you know, the olive orchard, the olive branch, the symbol of peace, the olive oil, the symbol of uh, sustenance. And, uh, Anyway, the, um, I just, I had, I did this for a show and I, uh, I sat down and, and just, it just came, came out and I then created the aura or the traditional um, halo, uh, golden halo, which is a symbol of uh, kindness and peace and, and resolution. Thank you so much for uh, participating in the artist talk. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask you about the halo and 
So there's some markings, some black markings over the halo. So are those what you were talking about, the uh, peace symbol, et cetera? The, that is the bulldozer and the olive tree, which is the roots of the olive, olive tree are uh, uh, clearly rooted in the halo. And uh, the bulldozer uh, traversing over the top of the halo. So yeah, that was intended. Okay, so those markings are part of the story of what happened in that. That's correct. Okay, okay, Paul, thank you so much for participating and sharing uh, the story of that piece. Okay, and so the next artist that we're gonna hear from is Dustin Bonabert. So Dustin, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from, tell us about your process and talk about the piece that's in the exhibition. Yeah, so uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dustin Bonnevert. Uh, I'm joining you tonight from my studio in San Francisco. And I would like to talk about my painting, uh, War Machine. Um, so uh, here's a question. Uh, who wishes that we could change something that's happened in the past few years? Um, this is something I often uh, wonder in my process. And uh, one of those things is how, um, how the United States left Afghanistan and uh, what is happening there right now. Um, so I was in the army. I fought in Afghanistan in 2009. Um, I was there for almost a year and uh, it was a traumatic experience. Um, and after I returned home, uh, one small comfort that I had was um, that no matter, uh, how many of my own problems I had to deal with. And um, no matter how misguided war is in the first place, I knew at least the people of Afghanistan uh, might have a better future than they would have had under the Taliban. Uh, and then last August, as quickly as the US left the country, um, the Taliban moved back in. So, um, yeah, suddenly my only comfort about that experience had been ripped away. And um, many of the missions that I went on there were to secure um, construction sites for schools for girls, um, health clinics for women, and just to, uh, at that point in the war was to help build a country where these people might have a better chance at life. And so uh, my question to myself was, uh, what exactly did we accomplish? Um, uh, what will a whole generation of children um, that grew up under the Tal or under U.S. occupation, you know, what would they deal with under the Taliban? And um, you know, or you know, was I delusional about uh, the U.S. accomplishing anything at all? Um, so I began sketching drawing and uh, working on a series of paintings. And one of those paintings is this one, War Machine. Uh, this is an oil painting. It's 18 by 24 inches on canvas. Um, and for this painting, I wanted to express the idea of the industrial war machine, um, but I wanted it to be figurative and approachable. Uh, so I modeled the machine after toys from my own childhood, toys which also happen to be based on war and violence and put this cartoon version of a boy I met inside. And so here he is trapped in this war machine and he keeps on marching on uh, even if we try to stop it. Uh, thanks for inviting me to talk about my work. Okay, Dustin, thank you for sharing that. So is the, um, the scenery that the boy is walking through, is that a specific location in Afghanistan? Uh, so I was in uh, Kunar province. Uh, this would be kind of the dry side of the Pesh River Valley. Um, you know, there's very green parts and there's very dry parts, but uh, mostly it's the north part of the country. Um, can look uh, basically dry with mountains or uh, lush and green. Okay, and the armor that the boy is wearing is looks like a tiger. So was that one of the the tiger soldiers that toys that you had when you were a kid? Yeah, so it's actually the uh, the I believe the, the Japanese robots uh, Voltron. Um, you know, looking back, they were kind of ridiculous toys, especially the toys where they were out of scale and stuff. But um, 
you know, they were also, uh, you know, kind of rooted in violence. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much for particip participating this evening and being in our exhibition. Our next uh, artist that we'll hear from is Robin Brownfield. So Robin, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, tell us a little bit about your process and the piece that's in the exhibition. Okay, uh, my name is Robin Brownfield. I'm in Collingswood, New Jersey. Uh, so I took a 3,000 mile trip to see you the other day. Um, I live about 10 minutes from Center City, Philadelphia. So um, uh, I was a former sociology professor um, who had to give up uh, teaching when I became disabled. And um, in order to fill in uh, the time of not having a job, I turned to art and it eventually gravitated towards uh, working specifically uh, with mosaic art. Um, and uh, so uh, mosaic, I've been doing uh, mosaic art probably for about 16 years, but uh, very consistently for the last 10 years. Um, and I've actually become very quite well known in my area for my work. So um, now in terms of my piece, um, the piece that I entered uh, is called uh, was is called Mom and Dad. Uh, it's a portrait of my parents. Uh, my father was a white Jewish man. My mother was Filipina. Um, they got married at a time when it was illegal in at least half the states in the United States uh, for uh, an interracial couple to get married. Uh, so um, the thing is when I was a child, uh, it never dawned on me that people perceived my mother as being different uh, until I was about six years old. I was living, my family was living in Ukiah, California um, and I witnessed my mother being subjected to, uh, periodically to kind of, um, well, uncomfortable behavior by other people because they perceived her as being dangerous or, um, untrustworthy or whatever. Um, and I grew to learn very quickly uh, about racism. Um, uh, it was also at the time when, um, you know, the civil rights movement was uh, in full force. So that was the backdrop to my, my growing up. Um, I did this one for, for a magazine in Philadelphia called Wild Greens Magazine and they publish a lot of my work um, every month. Um, and this one, the theme was heritage. And to me, this was like the, the one thing I really wanted to do because I'd never had a chance to uh, express or, or portray my um, own background and, um, and uh, my family's experiences with racism. And I've told a few people at, at the, the reception about some of those experiences. Um, so what I wanted to do when I made this portrait of my parents was just give them a, give as the background, the kinds of things that were in our environment as I was growing up, when they were getting, when they got married, when, as I was growing up, um, uh, which is basically a lot of very blatant racism. Okay, um, Robin, are most of your pieces making social political comments? I would say easily half of them are. You know, I do a lot of non-political stuff too, uh, but uh, I'm best known, uh, actually, this, this all basically got started for me when I did a series of Black Lives Matter 
uh, portraits in mosaic. Um, and each, por each portrait had four people who had been, uh, uh, four African-American people or black people who had been killed by cops or other racist, you know, racially motivated white people. Um, and um, I, it, this was during 2020 and we were all locked down and couldn't go, go anywhere. So I shared it in a group, uh, a local group on Facebook and within a few weeks, I was contacted by Tamika Palmer, who is Brianna Taylor's mother, who asked me to do a portrait of Brianna. Okay, thank you, Robin, so much. And our next artist is Rachel Davis. So Rachel, if you would uh, unmute yourself, uh, tell us where you're joining us from, uh, tell us about your process and the piece that's included in the exhibition. Um, hi there, and thank you so much for putting together the exhibition. It's it's really powerful and beautiful. I appreciate all your work and Tevi's as well. Um, my piece is from, um, it's called Kelly, and it's charcoal on post-it, a three by three inch post-it affixed to a panel. Um, this series started Back in 2019, I decided I've always been really interested in faces and I had taken a few years of classical portraiture um, in oil and I actually hated the, the classes because there were so many ways to be wrong, but I really was interested in faces. So I decided to do a, a 100 day project of really quick um, 15 minute portraits on, with, in pencil on pink post-it. And in very short order, that switched um, into charcoal on white post-its to bump up the value. And I found myself getting increasingly drawn in, but in a good way. I, I wanted to spend more than, I thought that the 15 minute limit for myself would help it be less precious and help me get better at it. And it did, but I just got really drawn in. So by the time I got to Kelly, who was one of my favorites, um, I was up to you know half an hour, an hour, two hours sometimes on these tiny little post-its. And they were very meaningful to me. I found myself gravitating towards um, pictures of women and wanting to see how much of their inner lives I could convey in a small space. And um, eventually, oh, one, one question I always get is where did I get the reference material? And there's an app called Sketchy, S-K-T-C-H-Y. And um, people post selfies of themselves for artists to practice on. When I went bigger on this and went public with it, I contacted all the people I had done to get their permission to use their work. But it's open to anybody to use. And what I've realized recently, because I went from this and I blew these post-its up to 10 by 10, reversed them, laser printers on, on a laser printer and um, photo transfer them onto larger pieces, 10 by 10s. And then I went on to do larger pieces of work, all of women, a figurative work. Now I'm doing life size. And I just realized that a lot of this came from um, a memory I have from when I was very tiny. I, I grew up in the 60s and none of us laughed at what I'm about to tell you. One of my brothers used to say to my mom, Esther, you wanna shut up? Sort of in a sing song voice. And we all thought this was very hilarious. Um, and only recently do I not find it hilarious anymore. And um, um, I don't think Esther wanted to show up. I did a shut up. I did a whole series based on her. And I, I feel like I'm amplifying women's voices. It's super important to me and compelling. But it's interesting how it takes sometimes years to look back and figure out what you've been doing all along. And it started with these little babies. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, Rachel, thank you so much for sharing that. So can you tell us why you chose to use post-it notes? Well, again, I was just trying to be quick. I thought they would be like quick and they'd get me in and out and, I, and, be, and the volume would, would get me better. And that happened. I mean, I learned more in those three months during the 100 day project. It was an incredible accelerated learning process. So the post-its were a good call and they're, and they're quite, I mean, as you see, they're sort of, they're very concentrated. <laughs> And um, it was, it, it did the trick. So I'm, I, I would do it over again. I recommend it for people. Okay, what a great concept. Okay, thank you, Rachel. So good sure. to see you. 
Okay, and our next artist this evening is uh, Betsy Kendall. So Betsy, if you would um, unmute yourself, uh, tell us where you're joining us from, uh, tell us a little bit about your process and talk about the piece that's in the exhibition. Hi, um, I, my name's Betsy Kendall. Um, my real name is Elizabeth, so you may be confused. Uh, I live in Berkeley and this is my studio in an old garage behind my house. Uh, I, I, um, let's see, I've been, uh, I've been working from the figure since I was a teenager. And uh, I, when I was in my middle years, I uh, participated in life drawing groups as a way of keeping going. Um, and I did a lot of figurative work from when gouache. Um, this particular piece uh, is, uh, just one of the many uh, figurative pieces that I did from the model. Um, I'm motivated by personal experience, uh, the confrontation that one has with uh, people in their in this charged environment of uh, the life drawing group, and also what ha what the surroundings tell us about uh, us and about the. Um, person we're drawing. So this guy is a fabulous figure model um, and I have been drawing him for a long time. Uh, he, this scene is uh, a friend's studio and my friend put many of her um, life drawings around in the, in the studio. So we have other, many other uh, figurative works around um, the model when we're drawing a different model. So this happened to be, uh, the model's name is Alex and there happened to be a painting of another Alex behind him. And <laughs> I just thought it was really funny. Uh, we are in our lives so many, there are so many of us uh, face to face and uh, meeting one another and kind of bouncing off in, in, in sort of this weird, uh, oblique way, uh, and this is emblematic, this sort of symbolized uh, to me, um, the experience. Um, in general, uh, you can probably see landscapes behind me. I work from personal experience. Um, I'm concentrating much more on the landscape nowadays. Uh, you probably see some landscapes behind me. Uh, my technique is to sit down in front of something that interests me and to work from that thing uh, to try to express the energy of that person or place uh, with uh, with my brush marks. Um, this particular piece is with gouache. Uh, I tend to work from the inside out so uh, I will sketch in paint with the um, large brush uh, the energy of the the subject. Okay, Betsy, thanks so much. We appreciate you participating in the exhibition and the talk this evening. Our next artist is uh, Joanne Marion. So if you could um, mute yourself, tell us uh, where you're joining us from, talk about your process and about the piece in the exhibition. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joanne. Uh, I'm in my studio in San Jose, and there's actually a blacksmithing class happening just on the other side of the wall. So if it gets noisy, apologies. Um, this piece is called Self-Portrait Egress. And uh, I made this piece over the span of a couple of years, working on it on and off. Um, it's made of acrylic paint sandwiched between a lot of layers of resin. Some of the acrylic is opaque and some of it is applied in um, glazes to build up from the layers beneath it. And I did that to create a sense of richness as well as like the physical depth within the painting. I just enjoy that. Um, making egress was, <laughs> was an act of, of rebellion for me against some negative experiences I was having during a time that I was really unhappy. And composing it required me to face the fact that I was complicit in the circumstances that I was in. Um, and acknowledging the fact 
that I was complicit, I found my way out of that situation. I found my egress. Um, and I used Adinkra symbols to help me. And I created a message to the world and myself that there was something better out there for me and that I would make it happen. It was, um, it was a process of a self-empowerment and an image meant to kind of help me manifest that, make that happen for, for myself. And for anybody who's not familiar with them, Adinkra symbols are um, symbols that were created by the Akan people of Ghana in West Africa. And originally they were printed on cloth and worn for special occasions. And depending on the symbols and the way they were arranged on the cloth, they would communicate different messages. And depending on the pieces that I used them in, I used them for either um, self-empowering messages like this one, um, or sharing my desires with the universe or communicating a message with other people at the world, in the world at large. Um, and I'm not familiar with the correct pronunciation for all of these symbols, so if anybody is, uh, apologies if I mangle them. Um, but I just wanted to share with you what the different, different symbols meant that are in here. And the ones that are above and below my lips are called Aya and they represent endurance, defiance, and resourcefulness. And the symbol on my nose and brow is called Nian Sapo and represents wisdom, ingenuity, ingenuity, and patience. And the symbol that's repeated all across my face, um, those are called Ani Bear and represent diligence and perseverance. And at the time of the painting, I felt like I was wearing a mask um, to get through the day from day to day. And so I decided to create a new one that was more powerful for me to get me to the place I wanted to be. That's it. Thank you for inviting me to talk about my work. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So um, we noticed in the piece that you're wearing the sunglasses and you're peering yeah. out from behind those. Is there any significance to that? Um, there's a little bit of kind of like, um, can't think of the word right now, but essentially just kind of like sticking it to you, I guess, but with a sense of like humor, <laughs> you know, just kind of like, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna give me a hard time. Well, see what, <laughs> well, just an attitude, I suppose, of trying to get myself past a space. Okay, and do you use those symbols in most of your pieces? Not most. If I'm honest, there was a point where I stopped using them because I was really concerned about uh, cultural appropriation. Um, I've done a lot of research. It made me stop using them for a few years, um, but I've done a lot of research into them and I'm starting to incorporate them again. So there's a lot of my work that doesn't incorporate them. Okay. Okay, Joanne, thank you so much for participating in the talk today and being part of the exhibition. And now our next artist is Jill Norstead. So Jill, if you would want to unmute yourself, uh, please introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. Talk about your process and the piece that's in the exhibition. Welcome. Thanks. Um, hi, I am Jill Norstead from Chicago in my home studio. And I'm so happy to be discussing my piece with you. Uh, I work mainly in painting and drawing, and I like to experiment with the contrast between different media like charcoal and gouache or watercolor and pen. Printmaking, specifically screen printing, is also part of my repertoire, though not part of this piece. Um, that said, I think it might be apparent that sometimes I see in flat layers, for example, the black and white flower graphics, which were painted with gouache. Um, I like how the layers look like they are pulled over the drawing like a screen or a blanket, like a barrier. Layers are a big part of my process. This piece, uh, Jojo from Chicago, is part of Hipsters, a series of intimate portraits of strangers tucked behind organic line work, all within starkly geometric space. I find my sitters on social media and become acquainted with them through their expressions and gestures. Each subtle mark means the difference between an accurate portrayal of the subject and just another face. I affectionately refer to them as my hipsters, probably because of the interesting poses and expressions that drew me to their pictures in the first place. 
Um, Webster's Dictionary defines hipster, um, the, first, the first definition of hipster, as a person who is unusually aware of and interested in new and unconventional patterns. This really speaks to me. Although I'm aware of the negative connotation assigned to that title, it's not what I'm referring to. Um, I like the word hipster because I feel like my age and my status as a parent leaves me a little out of the trend loop, but I'm dazzled by it nonetheless. <laughs> um, my strategy when searching for source images was to type in a neighborhood near me in Chicago, as I had been doing for another series that involved architecture and to find a face or a bust that appealed to me and that was tagged in that area. I would spend time with the person I landed on studying their expressions, sometimes looking through their feed and getting to know them. I was developing these one-sided relationships with people who were strangers, but also neighbors. When the world turned on its head, we were driven inside and forced to view almost everyone through that digital square and the intimate relationships that I was developing with the stranger neighbors started to reflect my relationships with my friends and loved ones. It was surreal. Um, situating the more precisely drawn subject in a rather flat, brightly colored space and hiding them partially behind a botanical veil was a way to call attention to the contrasts between organic and inorganic, physical and digital, and friends and strangers. Uh, most of the people I chose as my hipsters were tagged when I posted the paintings or drawings I created. They usually love it. Um, incidentally, Jojo from Chicago wasn't tagged right away, although I've been in this affair for her a while. I only just tagged her a few months ago and she hasn't responded yet. Um, thank you for having me. Okay, Jill, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so it seems very poignant with the pandemic that you would uh, do portraits of people through social media, but have you also done portraits of real people that you know personally? Um, I did, just as practice, I uh, did a portrait of my dad, and it was super weird, because <laughs> I'm so used to painting people I don't know, and I, I might hide behind that, because I'm so interested in um, getting the likeness, the likeness right, um, and my dad wasn't even happy with the picture I made of him initially, <laughs> so that was the only one I did. So the distance with the person actually enhances your representation of them. Yeah, and they're always really excited when their face shows up in my feed and I tag them and they're like, oh my gosh, that's so great. <laughs> You're a genius. And um, I, yeah, I don't, but no, not people. Near, I, I won't be commissioned to do portraits. And you've never had a negative response? No. Okay, that's great. So Jill, thank you so much for participating tonight. Thanks. Okay, and our next artist is uh, Gabby Rondell. So Gabby, if you go ahead and um, unmute yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. Um, tell us um, about your process and the piece that's in the exhibition. Yes, uh, first, I just wanted to thank uh, you and ARC Gallery, um, all those who made this exhibition and presentation possible this evening. Um, yes, I am Gabby Rondell and I am a, <clears throat> lens-based photographer living in San Mateo and working um, in and around the Bay Area. Um, I've owned Gabrielle Rondell Photography since 2000, um, photographing children and families and some events, and also do photojournalism and documentary work, which is, this is my latest project um, called Our Care Workers. And I show my work um, in and around the Bay Area. So when making photographs, I try to create a narrative and do my best to tell a story through pictures. And in order to achieve this, I let each situation unfold organically. And to, vote, uh, to evoke strong emotion, I begin by asking my subjects leading questions, which helps them share personal stories about their experiences. Um, their facial expressions and body language flow naturally, which compels me to make pictures. So this diptych that you're seeing now is Ella, who is a registered nurse um, at San Francisco, I'm sorry, UCSF. And um, during COVID-19, um, many, many harsh challenges, um, especially for those in the medical field who care for the sick and dying presented itself. Um, these brave care workers risk their own lives and the lives of their families on a daily basis to ensure 
we the public are taken care of. <clears throat> Women like Ella work 10 to 12 hour shifts, um, often with a little to no time off, no breaks, helping patients and staff while wearing cumbersome, uncomfortable protective gear. And through these photographs, I capture the dichotomous lives of these women. Their faces show determination and grit while wearing the PPE gear and then relief after discarding it. And now that the vaccine and boosters are being more widely administered, <clears throat> they're not being championed as they once were. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just to give one example, another care worker I photographed named Misty Schultz who's a respiratory therapist uh, for the past 20 years, described holding a patient's hand at San Francisco General Hospital as he died from COVID-19. He, he was a caring father and loving husband in his 40s, whose English was broken and Misty spoke very little English. She held the phone to his ear as he labored to breathe while his family, family listened and cried out <clears throat> and said their last goodbyes. Misty served as a lifeline for this man and his family as he took his last breath. And no family members were allowed to see their loved ones who were admitted to the hospital during this time. So she provided comfort and dignity, dignity for those suffering in a great time of need. Um, our care workers recognizes the immense toll COVID-19 has and continues to take on these valiant women. In interviews I conducted with each of them, they share their struggles and triumphs with truly highlight who they are and how this pandemic has changed their lives. These women are warriors. And that's the end of my statement. Okay, Gabby, thank you so much. Um, can you share with us how many of the care workers have you photographed like this? So up to 10 now, um, and I'm always looking for more in fact, um, but several of the women are at UCSF and then San Francisco General Hospital. And I did one um, dental assistant as well. And, and again, these women really had no, no breaks at all um, during the pandemic. So they really worked straight through and just felt like they need to be recognized and still. And the images in the background on the left side with the, um, all the, the multiple images, could you uh, talk about that? So that was just serendipitous to, <clears throat> excuse me, to photographing Ella. And in fact, there it's, it's really kind of like wallpaper that are on pillars that are in front of US, UCSF Medical as you enter the hospital. So these are, there's no um, literature or any kind of anything saying who they are or even, you know, you know, where they come from. But I just felt like it really added to the, to the project because I'm, in a lot of them getting very close to my subjects' faces and just felt like all the faces behind them was, of course, literal, but um, added to the images. Okay, Gabby, thank you so much for sharing all that information with us and giving us more insight into your work. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, and the next artist that had signed up is John Sheridan. So unfortunately, John wasn't able to join us tonight, but this is a look at his work, uh, Megademic. Um, very unusual sculpture that he included in the exhibition. So we're going to hear from Sianna Smith. So if we go ahead and go ahead and advance to Sianna Smith. So Sianna, go ahead and unmute yourself, share with us where you're joining us from, talk about your process and the piece that's included in the exhibition. Welcome Sianna. Thank you, Stefan. First, I would like to thank Art Gallery uh, for curating this uh, National Jeweled Show. And I thank you, the juror, uh, Tevi, um, jeweled my select my piece. I feel very lucky to be uh, in this show. Um, this uh, diptych, actually it's a triptych. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to my website or Instagram, look at the whole picture. Um, but then I find out, oh, there's a width <laughs> limitation, so I can only submit the diptych. Um, this, uh, painting, uh, I named it Family Time. So it's a little bit twisting um, of my interpretation of the face-to-face. -face. So um, this is actually a real scene, my family last year spending Christmas like this. And so in, a, in one room, a close a proximity, but they all facing every which way at their screen, but not to each other. But the reality is, <laughs> 
they are playing the same game. So in that game, they're wearing their avatar and uh, really face to face in that virtual world. So um, painting to me is actually gave me a voice to, to say what I want to express um, in me. Um, so for this scene, I kind of like a feeling, feeling just like a sad as a mother, you know, and during this holiday season, they come from different part of the um, country and get together, but then what they want to do, they feel comfortable raising on, you know, growing up with screens, they feel very comfortable just to, you know, communicate and the social, um, you know, with a screen and with each other <laughs> in a game. Um, so, I just feel like these screens, um, this uh, internet becomes an extension of us. Wherever we go, we carry that uh, cell phone or our laptop, laptop with us. It becomes an extension of us. And we, I feel like we almost become cyborgs, you know? Um, so I, my painting usually have a kind of like a, if you want to say a dark side of it, sort of like uh, in its subtlety, I questioning, um, I, I want to provoke the, you know, question from the audience, you know, what are they really seeing or not seeing? What's, what, what, what is a, um, the message behind that? So here is, um, I name it family time just to add the, another layer of uh, ironic. This is actually how, you know, family time it is. You know, I hope, I'm thinking I'm not alone in this area. Um, yeah, so I wonder, you know, do I, do they still, do they really know themselves? You know, do I really know my family? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Okay, Siana, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's interesting that Tavi Lee, the juror, commented about your piece during the presentation on Saturday night and said, this is like my sons when they come home for the holidays too. So she has a similar experience as you do also. Um, so it's an interesting perspective that you have that you're painting it from above looking down with kind of a wide angle. So could you share with us how you chose that? Yeah, I want to use this bird's eye view angle sort of like a little bit like a surveillance almost like it's me looking also could that be the virtual world that the internet is looking down and you know they are the children that become nodes on this like a virtual world in this uh, world wide web okay that's great well thank you for sharing that insight and we appreciate you participating in the talk this evening take care thank you okay and the next artist that we're hearing from is uh, Nogo Wazanski. So Nogo, if you go ahead and, and unmute yourself, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, uh, talk about your process and the piece that's included in the exhibition. Okay, uh, thank you and hi everybody. Um, my name is Nogo Wazanski and I'm joining today from my studio in Nevada City, Ustoma on the unceded and unrecognized land of the Nisenin people, um, my work. Uh, for many years, my, my primary media has been drawing, although I've had a secondary drift periodically into collage and most recently um, some painting. I, I love paper and charcoal and the rhetoric of erasure um, and also the rhetoric of fragments and suggestion. And I love the expressiveness of torn and cut edges. Uh, those are the processes that excite me. Um, as part of my family's recent move to, from Oakland to the Sierra foothills, I found myself cleaning my house, but also sorting through my flat file door, drawers and um, finding many works that were unresolved or too bogged down to rescue. And so I threw a, away a lot of stuff in my house, but instead of throwing those bad works away, I've um, been tearing them and combining the pieces with other elements and materials in all kinds of ways. And so this piece is one outcome from that project of um, remaking old work into 
something new with its own coherence. But it's also part of an, an ongoing series that I've been working on for several years now that relates more explicitly to the theme of this exhibit. Um, this, the series is titled Portraits of Friendship and Language, and it involves uh, joining observed drawings, my own drawings of people that I know with lines, written lines that other people, many of whom I don't know in person have written. And I select these lines mostly, I, I love to read, um, and the language has caught me. And sometimes because these lines resonate with something intrinsic to my encounter with the person I've drawn, um, I avoid spelling this resonance out explicitly, but it, it can be anything from the look in their eyes or a driving passion or commitment that they've shared with me, um, the social climate that we both inhabit at any given time. And so the texts incorporated into the images, they represent a different kind of encounter with people that is, for me at least, as intimate as a visual face-to-face -face encounter. And so it represents, I hope, a different interpretation of the theme of face-to-face uh, brought together with a more conventional interpretation. And, by, and so uh, I'll, just, I'll end by saying that bringing these two kinds of encounter together is also for me a way of thinking about community um, and the many ways that a personal community can take shape and what it might look like. Um, thank you all for listening to me talk about my work and, and to Art Gallery for uh, organizing the show, selecting my work and um, inviting me to talk about it. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so we notice in the, the portrait um, kind of has a cubist quality where it seemed like uh, the, the nose was slightly ajar or the eyes was uh, um, a little slanted. There were some different, uh, a lot of line quality in the face. Could you just address that very rich texture that you put in the face? Um, you know, I, I think perhaps, um, uh, I, I think I mentioned early that, that I love erasure. And so my drawing process is always, it, it involves, and I'm not good at getting things right the first time. So it always involves laying things down, lifting them up again. And um, this, in this one, specifically, I, I, I remember thinking that I wasn't going to take too much off. I was just going to do and redo multiple times. And so there are several attempts at the face all overlaid on one another. Um, it, it, the original was drawing, uh, drawing was, was titled uh, January 2017. And it was, uh, you know, many of you might remember that time very dismally. Um, and so, so the, the, the upheaval you know, and the 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 unfinishedness of you know of the marks kind of represent um, felt like a they they um, seem to to kind of get at or express the tumult that I was feeling. Okay, that um, makes sense. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you for giving a full a fuller explanation of that, and we appreciate you uh, participating in the talk this evening. And our last artist uh, tonight is Maria. Zalnina. So Maria, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself and introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, talk about your process and the piece that's included in the exhibition. Well, um, hello. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the um, opportunity to be part of this show. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I, I, um, I'm sorry I had to chase my son during the opening and I couldn't uh, congratulate everyone and say thank you to everyone. Um, so this, um, this picture is about my very personal experience uh, related to COVID. Um, I am um, one of the owners of our school of Bay. It's a, um, a small art school that teaches kids, adults uh, in different locations in the area. And when COVID came, um, and I'm the person responsible for the enrollment. So um, when COVID happened, I had to do something 
incredible to save all the people that amazing artists that 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 worked uh, for us and the students too. Uh, I switched to the online, have enough uh, people enrolled, but at the same time I got very sick myself. It was something very similar to COVID, and I was between the fear of losing my life because it was really really bad, and, and I didn't get much help at the moment. Um, and um, uh, losing my uh, business, not not being able to help others. Uh, but thanks God, um, none of that happened. Uh, but I remember uh, that very well, that, that, that feeling of endurance and and like feeling myself in hands of fate and trying to really shape with it. Um, I am a big fan of old master's technique, uh, you know, European artists, and I, I am a big fan of, in particular, supported by Durer and supported by Gustave Courbet, where he's doing this, <laughs> doing a series like this. Um, and these are the references for this work. And of course, uh, I was uh, the hairstylist, and that's where I take photographs of his hands working on, on me. That's basically what I was trying to express, that, that fear and at the same time getting stronger through it. Yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to say. Okay, Maria, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, could you tell us uh, why you chose the circle um, in the design of the painting that you did? Um, at that time of my life, um, every sketch I would make was in circle. <laughs> um, I guess it's part of the of the healing process, and because circle is like the most uh, quiet and and uh, harmonic shape for me. So I guess that's that's the symbol. Okay, so thank you for sharing that symbolism with us. We appreciate you participating in the talk tonight in the exhibition. Uh, we have another artist talk next week on Wednesday, May 25th. So thank you for joining us tonight and be sure to visit Art Gallery to see the face-to-face -face National Juried Exhibition. We are open on Saturdays from 12 to 3 and on Wednesdays and Thursdays from 1 to 6 p.m. through June 11th. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and we hope to see you at our next artist talk. Good night, everybody.